Hello and welcome to the online ice hockey rules meeting for coaches. My name is Ronald Sayers and I'm the Assistant Director of Membership Services and the Ice Hockey Administrator here at the Ohio High School Athletic Association. Later on, you will hear from Gary Wilkins, our Director of Officiating Development in Ice Hockey, who I also deem as our rules expert and will be working on all things ice hockey with regard to officiating. The major role of this rules meeting is to detail the NFHS rules changes points of emphasis, and editorial changes for the season, as well as a few of our OHSAA regulations that affect ice hockey. I will be going over the OHSAA regulations and things to keep in mind, while Gary will go over the NFHS rules changes, points of emphasis, and interpretations. Before we get started, if you are using a Chromebook, we strongly recommend you stop and use a different device to view this presentation. If you choose to proceed with using a Chromebook, please be aware that your attendance may not be recorded or the presentation may stop. All users, regardless of the device used to complete this presentation, should take a screenshot at the last slide of this presentation as proof of completion in the event credit is not automatically awarded and the screenshot is requested by the Ohio High School Athletic Association. Some things to consider with the 2020-21 school year and ice hockey season uh, with COVID-19 considerations can be found on the OHSA COVID-19 correspondence page. You can find the link right there. It's also on our homepage at ohsaa.org. This page contains sports specific guidance, historical communications, and important links with regard to COVID-19. Depending on the time that you are viewing this meeting, you should have received your COVID-19 guidance and recommendations with regard to ice hockey specifically. If you have any questions regarding that guidance, please feel free to reach out to me at the office. My email is rsayers at ohsaa.org. My phone number is 614-549-6969. Aside from this rules meeting, we have several resources that will be very beneficial to you prior to during and after the ice hockey season. We ask that you take some time to review these documents prior to the season beginning. First is the ice hockey manual, which covers all items mentioned in this rules meeting a little bit more in depth. And its purpose is to be a one-stop shop for any rules and or regulations with regard to the sport of ice hockey. Also on the ice hockey webpage are the general sport regulations, specific regulations for ice hockey, our tournament regulations, and our tournament information page. Specifically, the tournament information page will be updated as we get closer to tournament time throughout the ice hockey season. Not on our website is the NFHS rules book. This may be purchased for $7 from our office, while the NFHS offers an electronic version on their app. Concussions have been at the forefront of injury prevention in the past few years, and with that, concussion prevention deservedly should be addressed. Coaches and officials continue to have the authority to remove players for exhibiting the signs and symptoms of concussion. All required concussion training helps coaches and officials recognize these signs and symptoms. You must complete either the NFHS or CDC concussion course once every three years upon renewal of your pupil activity permit. Any player that is removed from a practice or contest cannot return to participate on the same day as being removed under no circumstances. Should a player be removed for these reasons, the official must file a concussion report to the OHSAA within 48 hours of the contest using the OHSAA adopted form found on our website. All coaches and officials must be on the lookout for any of these signs and symptoms when a player has hit their head. Please continue to pay special attention to your athletes when a head injury is suspected. For more information, please visit the OHSAA.org sports medicine page. While practice may begin on October 30th, 2020, the 2020-21 regular season is slated to begin on Friday, November 20th. Please remember, a four-day acclimation period must be observed starting with the first day of practice on October 30th. We will go into this in a little bit more detail later on. Further, scrimmages can be played starting on November the 3rd, but no regular season contest can be played until November the 20th. If any contests are scheduled with regard to regular season prior to the 20th, penalties will apply. Please note, 
any dates that we do set forth for the 2020-21 school year are certainly tentative due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Any changes will be relayed to you directly from myself. Expanding on our last slide a little bit more, you can see the full breakdown here of practices, scrimmages, and contest limitations. So as we mentioned, practice begins on Friday, October 30th, 2020, or may begin on Friday, October 30th, 2020. Um, a four-day acclimation period must be observed starting with the first day of practice. Should that be October 30th? Should that be November the 2nd? what have you, a four-day acclimation period must be observed during those first four days of practice. This four-day acclimation period may not keep begin prior to October 30th. I know this has happened in the past. However, this has been a breach of our rules and regulations. So please do not complete this four-day acclimation period any sooner than November 3rd as that is the four-day period from October 30th to November 3rd. That's the earliest the acclimation period can be finished. Also note, any student that joins the team later on in the season for the first time must observe a four-day acclimation period prior to completing or competing in any contest. Even if that student's been competing in contests with a club team, they still have to go through the four-day acclimation period for, before competing in any OHSA contest. Scrimmages uh, can begin on November the 3rd, assuming you complete your four-day acclimation period from October 30th to November 3rd. Should you begin practice later on, scrimmages cannot start until that four-day acclimation period is finished. Uh, you can have up to four scrimmages or three scrimmages and one preview. These scrimmages can take place at any time during the season and can even be during tournament time. Please note that practicing with another team is also considered a scrimmage. Another note is that any scrimmage must be a scrimmage for both teams. So you cannot be considering a game a scrimmage while the other team considers it a regular season contest and vice versa. Both must be considering it a scrimmage or it would be considered a regular season contest. In terms of regular season contests, you have a 35 maximum limitation. Um, all contests played outside of the OHSA tournament count towards this 35. This includes any conference tournaments, any regular season contests, it includes the Blue Jacket Cup um, down here in Central Ohio, anything like that at all, count towards that 35. Scrimmages and the OHSA tournament do not count towards the 35. A note on our NFHS versus USA Ice Hockey Rules June 5th memo. This was sent out after we had several questions about what rules schools should be participating uh, under throughout the season. Please note that the OHSA Board of Directors has adopted the NFHS Ice Hockey Rules Book as the official contest rules for our member schools. So we've laid this out in a June 5th memo, and this is how you are to be moving forward. Contests between two, OH two OHSA schools must use NFHS rules and OHSA registered officials. If you are competing against a non-OHSA school or team and your school is the host, so this is the home contest for you, you have to use NFHS rules and OHSA registered officials. Competing against a non-OHSA school or team in the state of Ohio, but you are not the host, USA Ice Hockey rules are permissible, not encouraged, but permissible, but OHSA res registered officials must be used. And lastly, if you're competing against a non-OHSA school or team outside the state of Ohio, and that school or team is a registered USA ice hockey team, USA ice hockey rules are permissible. It's very unlikely that NFHS ice hockey um, official, officials could be used in this situation. Therefore, it's your responsibility to report any penalty that is equivalent to a DQ under NFHS rules to our office. A failure to report these um, penalties that are equivalent to DQs will result in a meeting with our executive director to determine the fine uh, or, or penalty up to removal from the OHSA ice hockey tournament. So again, please make sure that you are reporting anything that is the equivalent to a DQ under NFHS rules to the OHSA office should you not have NFHS or OHSA officials and you're playing under USA ice hockey rules. Another side note, 
with regard to traveling outside the state of Ohio. And you'll notice this in the ice hockey sports specific guidance with regard to COVID-19. Please keep an eye out for any travel restrictions set forth by the governor's office. This may cause your team to observe a quarantine period uh, with regard to your local health department. So again, please keep in mind um, if you do travel over to Pennsylvania or up to Michigan or over to Indiana uh, and, and those states become uh, restricted in terms of travel, you may have to observe a quarantine period. So again, just keep that in mind if you're planning to travel outside the state of Ohio this year. Several notes on ejections. Um, when a player is ejected, they are to remain in the bench area under supervision of a coach or a school administrator, uh, as the last thing we want is an ejected player running off to the locker room, to the bus, to the common area of the ring that you're competing in. Uh, so they are to be supervised at all times. Um, they're also ineligible for any contests for the remainder of that day, including contests that are taking place at a level in which they were not ejected. Uh, so even if they were a JV player, they could not compete in the varsity contest later on that day because they have been ejected. On top of that, they're ineligible until two contests at that same level they were ejected have been completed. So if they were a JV, uh, JV player um, competing in the JV contest when they were ejected, they're ineligible for the next two JV contests um, or until the next two JV contests have been completed. So they can't compete in any varsity contests still, but once two JV contests have been completed, then their ineligibility period will um, finish up. Another note on this, um, the suspension period for fighting specifically has been increased to four games. So if a player is ejected because of a fighting issue, they will not be eligible until four contests at that same level have been completed. During their suspension period, um, they are permitted to practice with the team, but they cannot ride to and from the next contests with a team. They cannot sit with the team, um, nor are they to be in the locker room prior to, during, or after the contest, um, and they may not be in uniform or participate in any sort of warm-ups with the team. Um, if you as a coach are ejected, you must leave the facility immediately. Uh, the coach is ineligible to um, coach in any contests for the remainder of that day, um, and they're also ineligible to coach in any contests until two contests at that same level have taken place. Um, the ejected coach may not sit with that team, may not be in the locker room prior to, during, or after the contest. Um, they may sit in the stands, however, they cannot be giving instruction from a different location such as the stands. Um, additionally, uh, any coach who is ejected must complete the NFHS's teaching and modeling behavior course, and they must pay a $100 fine to the OHSAA's Respect the Game program. And lastly, and most importantly, no appeals um, will be granted for ejections. All, all ejections are final. Um, if you do have some video evidence that may point to the contrary. The uh, OHSA office will not overturn the ejection, but we will take that and use that as a learning opportunity for officials um, and for schools involved. So feel free to send that over, but please note, nothing will be overturned as all ejections are final. Several things you'll want to consider uh, with regard to game administration or, or game management. Um, uh, this, uh, this includes ensuring the safety of officials, uh, dealing with any unruly fans, uh, handling any medical emergencies, and then even coordinating crisis management um, and handling any weather issues. Well, uh, that may not be um, super common, but it, it certainly does happen. So you will want to have some plans in place. Um, please work with the rinks that you are competing at to ensure that you have plans in place for, for fans, for players, for coaches, um, and any other staff involved um, to make sure that everything does run smoothly should a situation arise. Uh, the OHSA bylaws do request that a, um, a school administrator be present for all ice hockey contests. However, it's not required. So you as a coach may ultimately end up completing the, these sort of items. 
Um, so again, please work with your um, local ranks that you're competing at and relay this information to your coaches, to your student athlete, um, to your to your parents, um, and to any school administration that may need that so that everybody is on the same page should a situation arise. Looking a little bit ahead to our tournament, um, the state tournament for ice hockey is a little bit different from other team sports. Um, our office, uh, me specifically, uh, handles the, the tournament and the uh, coordination of the tournament solely. So you do not work with any of our six district athletic boards, um, but you will instead be working with myself as well as our tournament managers at the four districts that we use, Kent, Sylvania, uh, Brooklyn, and Columbus. Um, this year's tournament is slated to take place um, February 15th to March 14th with February 15th to March 6th being the time for district tournaments, and then March 13th and 14th being our state tournament at Nationwide Arena. Um, all tournaments are conducted under the OHSA tournament regulations. Um, as we talked about a little bit earlier, those will be posted on the OHSAA uh, ice hockey webpage. They may be a little bit delayed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so again, things are extremely fluid. So please be on the lookout for those, and I will make sure that you all receive a note whenever that um, that tournament regulation um, packet is finalized. Um, and again, those will be sent to you uh, once we get word back from the governor that we can move forward. Um, again, any changes that, that may come about because of the COVID-19 pandemic will be relayed to you from me as soon as we hear them, so you will never be kept in the dark. So at this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to, uh, again, our Director of Officiating Development, Gary Wilkins, to talk about the NFHS rules, changes, interpretations, and points of emphasis. Thank you so much. It's Gary Wilkins, DOD for Ice Hockey. Welcome to the 2020-21 Ice Hockey Rules Interpretation Meeting. So Federation a state high school associations is made up of eight districts. And uh, these uh, federations serves 51 state associations and 19,500 schools and over 13 million student participants. We write the playing rules for you know, all federation high school sports uh, throughout the country. Rules committee that actually reviews all, uh, all rule changes and all proposals for changes. The people listed here are on the National Federation High School Rules Committee and represent all of us. The NFHS has rule books uh, as e-books. For those of you that would like to get uh, the e-book, you can contact the National Federation for High School, NFHS, and a copy uh, it can be downloaded. National Federation High School is also now uh, supplying a app uh, that you can have on your cell phone, okay, and you see down at the bottom, uh, you know, of, uh, chart on the right, uh, it gives you the uh, location where you can go and uh, get more information regarding this app if you'd like to download it. Changes for the 2020-21 ice hockey season. I just wanted to point out to everybody, uh, the members of the committee, representing our area here in Ohio is Joe Raybeck. Uh, Joe Raybeck uh, will be on the committee again next year uh, I represent officials nationally on the committee, and I will be uh, no longer on the committee. This is my last year. They will be replacing me with somebody from one of the other districts. This is kind of a rotating position, you know, for officials and for coaches uh, on the committee. And uh, uh, so look forward to next year, a new individual uh, to represent officials. Aspects of the committee is to first look at rules, okay, that uh, uh, where potential injury could be involved. Player safety is utmost important. The first rule change that we have 
is Rule 3.2. Okay, that uh, rule really uh, now clearly uh, indicates that a game misconduct would be given to any player who uh, has potentially dangerous equipment. I ask that you take time and read through uh, Rule 3.2 regarding dangerous equipment. And uh, again, uh, we have changed it now to it goes right to a game misconduct. Player with uh, dangerous equipment uh, being removed from a game and then being able to come back uh, in a game, you know, correcting the equipment uh, is not acceptable, okay? In that we really, really want to uh, ensure the safety of all players at all times. 3, 4-2, okay, we've modified that rule a little bit. As you know, in uh, the state of Ohio, it is required, okay, to wear a uh, throat, neck, laceration protector. This in the rule book this year, we added really uh, a laceration protector because, you know, the throat protector doesn't really protect a player, uh, you know, entirely from a puck or a stick, you know, hitting him in, in the neck. Uh, so therefore we've added the wording in there that's really a laceration protector. This was done as a result of a lot of research, okay, by a sports medicine, you know, par portion of the National Federation organization who uh, really advises us, you know, on, on these type things. And uh, they've indicated that really uh, the best throat protectors really protect the throat from, and the neck from laceration. Rule 7-6-1. Uh, in this rule, we really had a lot of discussion about this, but you know, we, we've often seen uh, players go into the boards and you know, will have their hand up and will hit a player, you know, in the uh, face and the uh, uh, helmet. And really, it, you know, the officials are not calling it as a roughing penalty or a, uh, a fight, but it's also, you know, in, important, you know, that the uh, player keeps their hands down, okay? So this change uh, would gives the officials uh, the ability to give uh, a major penalty option for a single punch to the head area uh, that they deem not to be considered as a fighting disqualification, but yet it was a punch to the player. Okay, the next rule change, rule 7-13-3. What we've done is we've added here that uh, no player shall kick, throw, or hold, or knock an opponent's stick and we've added glove, tooth, and mouth protector, or any piece of other, uh, you know, equipment for the purpose of keeping away from the possession of the opponent. Okay, so again, we've added uh, the glove, uh, tooth, and mouth protector. Uh, we've had these incidences, uh, you, know, you know, throughout the years where a uh, player's glove uh, will be off and, and fall on the ice for for whatever reason. And, you know, we want to prevent the uh, opponent from knocking that glove away from that uh, player or the tooth or mouth protector if it were to fall out. Uh, we really want these uh, items picked up by the player who drops them uh, before any injury uh, could happen. The next rule change, rule 9-13. As you know, in the state of Ohio, we do not use video replay. However, there are many, many states now that are beginning to use video replay in uh, more and more in their games. And so we've also added now that, you know, if it's used, video replay is used, it can be used to review an infraction that may affect the ejection of a student athlete. Now, with that said, the video replay 
has to be authorized by the National Federation and the Ohio High School Athletic Association. This does not include video replay you know, from parents or uh, teams or you know, anything like that, okay? We do not use video replay during regular season games. We do use it during the state playoffs uh, at the uh, nationwide at the final four. However, uh, that it, it's the only time that we could use it, okay, to review infractions that may affect the ejection of a student athlete. I'd like to take a moment and review a few of the points of emphasis that we really think are, uh, you know, the ones that we'd really like to highlight a little bit and, and just get everybody's attention and, and you know, and, and thoughts into these. The committee believes uh, that the main threat to the health of high school hockey is violent and reckless play. The safety and well-being of the participants is paramount and the primary focus of this committee. The committee has addressed the following areas to emphasize dangerous and violent and reckless play. First, I'd like to address the uh, coach's safety. You know, it is recommended that all members of the coaching staff wear an HECC certified helmet while on ice uh, for practice. Okay, this is a requirement in the state of Ohio uh, that's mandated by uh, the Ohio High School Athletic Association. The next point of emphasis that we'd like to talk about is the dangerous hits. The purpose of a body check is to gain possession of the puck, not to injure or punish or intimidate the other player. I think we all know this, uh, you know, but we really ask that you re-emphasize this with your players. Sometimes, you know, emotions get very high in a game, as we all know, and, you know, a player will run at another player, okay? And, you know, we really need to really emphasize, you know, that this is not acceptable, you know, practice of playing, and uh, we really need to penalize that as officials. Again, this year, we want to emphasize the concussion recognition and management. There's a lot of material out there, both on the Ohio High School Athletic Association website and the National Federation site for concussion awareness and safety. Please review it. Take time uh, to look at the guidelines for management of concussions, uh, you know, and, and uh, educate yourself uh, of the symptoms for a concussion and what actions should be taken. Mouth guards. Seems like every year we talk about mouth guards and, you know, this is really, really important. Okay, uh, you know, talking to officials and, and uh, other coaches, the, you know, games are being delayed, you know, with mouth guards not being you know, uh, you know, properly inserted in, in the player's mouth. And, you know, we really need to make sure that, you know, all players have a mouth guard and please enforce the mouth guard, you know, and, you know, the it really relies, you know, primarily on the coaches and the officials to work cooperatively to emphasize the player's safety and ensure that they have their mouth guards, you know, in place. Just a quick minute on sportsmanship. All coaches, officials, administrators, parents, and participants need to understand their role in education-based athletics and activities. Fair play and respect are an essential part of high school hockey. Create a positive learning environment and respect for all participants, fans, officials, coaches, and administrators at all times. Couple of notes uh, uh, regarding game management uh, for your officials. Hey, the face off, both teams must have an equal opportunity to play the puck. Let's get the players lined up properly 
okay, when conducting a face-off. Icing. If the puck is shot from behind the center red line and potential icing applies, it's improper to wave off icing simply because the puck is close to the red line or close to a player, uh, you know, and, and you, know, you, you say, well, he should have played the puck. Okay, call the icing. Your job isn't to rush to get the game over. It's to call the game fairly, you know, with respect for the rules. Again, officials, offsides. You've got to be in the proper position to call offsides. Continually, continually have issues and complaints, uh, you know, in past seasons about officials not hustling. Oh, it's, uh, you know, a blowout game, uh, you know, and not hustling up, you know, to the line. For the, for the players and, you know, and the coaches and everybody, every call, every play, you know, in the minute of the game is important to them. So please hustle, work, uh, you know, and, and get the job done properly by getting up to the uh, blue line and, you know, and, and watching for those offsides and making the right call. You know, a smooth flowing game is a great experience for all participants and spectators. However, it doesn't mean that the officials should just let them play, okay? You just need to officiate the game, you know, by and use the rules and call the game according to the rule book. Just a quick note for coaches and administrators. It is the responsibility of the head coach to ensure that all participants are equipped according to the rules. Okay, this includes wearing an HEC's uh, certified helmet with a face mask, including the ear clips, okay, the J clips, uh, the ear pieces, and, a, uh, the, and it has a valid sticker on it. You know, a lot of these helmets are getting old and, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're not safe, okay, for the players. And, and as a result, uh, players get concussions, you know, as a result of, uh, you know, old helmets that, you know, are dried out, just worn out, okay? And coaches need to be aware of this. So please make sure your uh, players are equipped properly with the correct helmet. Next, just a couple of rule book reminders. Hey, this year we put something new in there in a rule book. And I think this is really important, okay? Uh, especially for the, uh, you know, the coaches and, and uh, uh, the uh, coaches committee, you know, uh, that we have, you know, there are certain rules that by state adoption, okay, can be uh, modified, okay? Okay, uh, these are, we've listed this and put it on a chart. The chart can be found on page 78 of the rule book. I encourage all coaches to look through this. Uh, make sure you understand, you know, if uh, the OHSA has adopted, you know, a modification to any of these rules. Okay. And, you know, and if, if you see something there that you believe should be a modification, you know, going forward, please contact uh, Ronald Sayers, uh, or your uh, local coaches association representative, and uh, let, let's discuss that, okay? And again, we, we want to you know, give you the opportunity to participate, you know, in some of these uh, rules where a modification it, you know, can be made. Again, this year we included the rink diagrams, and as you know, you know, uh, there's a lot of different. Uh, configurations and rinks, uh, you know, as a result of uh, at both NHL and, and other play and uh, sizes of the rinks. Uh, you know, very few rinks are uh, uh, owned by a, uh, a school. Uh, so therefore, uh, we're, we're putting this in there, you know, as, you know, what we believe they should be, okay, and would like them to be, although we know that, uh, you know, there are going to be uh, in most cases, situations where these dimensions uh, don't apply. Hey, again, this year, we, uh, just a reminder, the goalkeeper's mask, we've actually put pictures in there now of the uh, cat eye uh, mask that is certified. 
uh, the cat hide is not certified and the HEC certified and what an uh, HECC uh, non-certified helmet uh, looks like for goaltenders. So please utilize these pictures. You know, uh, you know the, the, the goaltenders, uh, you know, safety is, is really important, okay, to all of us. And as you can see, and non-certified, you know, a puck, you know, stick can uh, get in there and, and do, uh, you know, significant eye damage to the goaltender. So we ask that you look at these, go over them with your goaltenders, make sure that their masks conform to the specifications. Hey, another note for officials, uh, we've included again, okay, this year, all the signals, uh, as you recall that we revised this, you know, a couple of years ago and, you know, we added, you know, some officials kind of modernized it, if you little, uh, if you will, and uh, I think it's a real good thing. Okay, uh, you know, with all of these, I, I would like to ask that, you know, the officials, you know, at, at your local rules meetings, you know, you take time uh, at one of the meetings just to go through all the signals, you know, with uh, your fellow officials and uh, to make sure we're all on the same page. You know, it gives the uh, coaches and the spectators, you know, the, the understanding of, of what calls you're making uh, when you make a call. Hey, I want to thank you very much for taking time uh, out of your busy days and uh, review, taking and reviewing you know, the uh, rule interpretation meeting for this year. Thanks again and have a great and safe season.